Good day, everyone. On behalf of Cambridge Health Tech Institute's Global Web Symposia Series and our sponsor, Biomodels LLC, I'd like to welcome you to Innovation in Translational Rodent Models of Colitis. My name is Elizabeth Lamb, and I'll be the host and the moderator for today's event. I'd like to introduce our presenters for today. First is Gregory D. Ling, PhD, Partner and Chief Operating Officer for Biomodels LLC. And our second presenter is Caitlin S. L. Parello, PhD, scientist from Biomodels. Welcome, Greg and Caitlin. The presenter ball is yours. Thank you, Elizabeth. So, but thank you very much for the introduction. As you mentioned today, we will be talking about uh, translational rodent models of colitis. And to get started today, you know, I'll just start with a little brief introduction about Biomodels and um, our company and, and what we do here. We are located just outside of Boston and in Watertown, Massachusetts. Our company was founded back in 1997, so we are in our 20th year of business now as a spinoff out of our Chief Scientific Officer's Lab at the Brigham and Women's Hospital affiliated with Harvard University. Our focus ever since being founded has been on developing and running highly translational models of human disease, and that spans across many different types of clinical conditions and ranges in terms of clients from small startup companies to big pharma. Our therapeutic expertise has also grown over the years. As we first started, we were primarily focused on cancer supportive care indications. And then throughout the years, we've basically grown into a virtually pretty much any category you can think of now, um, with inflammation and autoimmunity being a big component of what we do. Microbiome, as we'll talk a little bit about today, oncology, pulmonary disease, fibrosis, cardiovascular disease, metabolic disorders, and, and even some neuroscience models. I think one of the most important things that we can say as a company and, um, you know, as, and for partners that we work with is that we've been really successful in what we've done. I mean, have facilitated, facilitated over 50 compounds or biologics um, from concept stage into clinical trials. And the conditions and the therapeutic indications have been, um, you know, several, and that's from. So the learning objectives for today, we want to go through and, and just do a little bit of a background on inflammatory bowel disease and a little bit of the differentiators between Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, as well as where the current treatment strategies are and where new research and, and new treatments are, are coming down the pipeline. Following that, we'll take a look at several of the different models of IBD and colitis that we run here at Biomodels and basically talk a little bit about some of the pros and cons of each of them and how they respond to some standard of care therapies and positive controls. After that, I'm going to be switching over and handing it off to Caitlin, who's going to be talking a little bit more about the microbiome and just in general how it is involved in or thought to be involved in inflammatory bowel disease and then some of the ways that we can manipulate classical experimental models and rodents to address questions about the microbiome and how they may be influencing disease progression or, or treatment. And finally, Caitlin will talk a little bit about a, a new model that we've developed here looking at an infectious colitis as induced by C. difficile infection. So to begin, just a little background on inflammatory bowel disease. Um, IBD itself is, a, is basically a category of a number of different diseases. And, you know, the two most um, common ones are going to be ulcerative colitis and, and um, Crohn's disease, as we'll talk a little bit more detail about. Now, all of the IBD diseases basically will have periods of, of active disease and then periods of remission. And during those phases of active disease, Patients will have diarrhea, abdominal pain, bleeding, and ulceration of um, gastrointestinal tissue. Typically, it's diagnosed by endoscopy, and, and patients with IBD will undergo you know, periodic um, endoscopic assessment to um, track disease progression and, and, and healing. One of the critical things about IBD is that we really don't know what causes it. And with that, you know, we'll talk about different treatment strategies and, and the number of options that there are to target IBD is, is, is pretty vast. You know, there's, a, there's probably environmental conditions, some genetic predisposition, as well as potential microbiome predisposition that is, uh, you know, contributing to these disease factors. 
in general, um, IBD epidemiology, it's, it's a very prevalent disease and, and as such, you know, is, um, is, is you know, making it a very big drug market as well. Currently, there's over 1.5 million cases of IBD in the U.S. and over 2.5 million in Europe. So, you know, you're looking at a very large patient population. As I mentioned, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease are the two most common of the disease states. And it's pretty much a 50-50 mix in terms of patients that present with each disease. According to the newest figures from the Crohn's Colitis Foundation, up to 70,000 new cases um, of IBD are diagnosed annually. And while onset can occur at any age, most of the patients that are diagnosed are um, relatively young and um, with Parkinson's occurring in late adolescence. So it's a chronic condition that you know, patients deal with their entire lives. As I mentioned, UC and Crohn's disease are the two major uh, inflammatory bowel disease diseases. And the, the major differences between ulcerative colitis and Crohn's is that ulcerative colitis only affects the colon. And the inflammation is, is restricted to the mucosa and submucosa. And there's a slightly different cytokine profile that characterizes ulcerative colitis, primarily being Th2 driven um, response. Crohn's disease, on the other hand, can affect any part of the intestine. And so it can be anywhere from small bowel to colon to even um, sometimes even esophagus. And the inflammation and um, active disease areas are intermixed with what would essentially be normal tissue. And we'll see that in some of the rodent models that we look at as well. And so there's really kind of a patchy distribution of disease and um, it occurs both in, in patients as well as some of the animal models that we work with. In juxtaposition to ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease usually has a um, Th1 skewing in terms of cytokine profiles. As we look at the current approach to treatment of IBD, and we look at this pyramid here that we've developed, it's just kind of showing how, how treatment strategies start from the bottom and work their way up in terms of the more aggressive um, approaches. And to start, you know, with the kind of the safety profiles of these is, uh, you know, important as well as the, you know, the feasibility of treatment. Um, at the bottom, of the, the bottom of the spectrum, you know, the kind of frontline therapies typically are uh, something along 5 ASA for ulcerative colitis. Unfortunately, Crohn's disease does not respond to 5 ASA, so that usually um, requires a slightly more um, aggressive treatment regimen, possibly with corticosteroids. The corticosteroid use is, is, works well for induction of remission. It is not not a viable treatment strategy for long-term maintenance therapy. So for that, some of the more common immunosuppressive drugs are used, such as 6 mercaptopurine methotrexate, cyclosporine A, or tacrolimus. Interestingly, I think as, as the spread of um, biologic therapies has, has grown, a lot of these earlier frontline therapies are being, I think, used less, um, and more patients are going, you know, uh, to biologics sooner than I guess would probably um, be typical. Um, and both, you know, the, the most common is certainly NITNF therapies. Um, there are a variety of different drugs in the NITNF category um, that, have been, that are used for IBD. Um, and some of the newer ones looking at um, things like uh, anti-alpha-4, beta-7 um, integrant inhibitors. And then finally, if responsiveness to any of these treatments is, is not adequate, you know, surgical resection is kind of the final approach for, for controlling the disease state. And as I mentioned earlier, there are obviously a number of different targets that can be looked at for IBD and, and new potential therapies. And this is a figure from a recent review in Nature that talks about you know, the different targets that people are looking at, the mechanisms, and, and some of the drugs that are, are, are currently being developed in, in the clinic. Everything from looking at the endothelial tissue to macrophages to focusing on the uh, microbiome for dysbiosis and, and barrier function down to the you know, fibroblasts and, and specifically T-cells and cells. Obviously, these are a wide variety of mechanisms and um, also looking at some sort of combination therapies are, uh, there's a lot of information on that as well. So next, we're going to kind of shift into talking about some of the animal models that can be used to model these two clinical conditions, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. And, you know, this is kind of our you know, description of what we would classify as a, the perfect animal model. 
Um, obviously, no animal model is perfect, but you know, I think what we try to do is make sure that the models are as translational as possible and that there's actionable information that can be obtained um, from any sub or for any tests that are done. So first, the model must replicate the clinical condition. And that the endpoints that we use to show efficacy in these models must be translatable to those that are used in clinical trials. Obviously, it's important that the underlying biology should be as close to the human condition as possible. And the models must be cost effective in order for, you know, for, for people to be willing to test these. So some of the advancements that we've made and that we've been working with for a number of years in the IBD space is the use of um, endoscopy in the assessment of disease severity and, and treatment response. Um, as the FDA's push is really that a drug must show that there are mucosal healing effects in order to be considered efficacious in the clinical setting. I think what's nice about the endoscopy technique is that we can actually show some images that are you know, quite similar to that of, uh, of, of clinical endoscopy images. And you know, if we look here on the figure on the right-hand side of this image, um, we can see human versus rodent. And basically what we're looking at in the top piece here is what a normal tissue would look like. And then as we go down to ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, and we'll talk more specifics about these models. So as we talk more specifics about these models, we'll see that some of the mouse models will actually really pretty closely reflect what the human disease state looks like in terms of ulcerative disease, in terms of bleeding and inflammation. Um, one of the key things about endoscopy is that we can do this several times in an animal, um, basically tracking it longitudinally as would be done in a, in a clinical setting. So looking for A, disease induction, and then B, looking at the response on the um, right side of the curve, essentially. So as I mentioned, when we, when we assess these animals via endoscopy, what we're looking at is a, is a number of different parameters um, in terms of the colon response. And as we look here on, the, uh, on these images, we can basically look at the progression of disease from being a normal colon on the left with nice clean vasculature, very thin tissue, almost translucent. And then as disease progresses, we'll start to see edema, inflammation, thickening of the colon. Um, and as we get to even more severe disease states, we'll start to see areas of bleeding or friability upon contact, um, and then even active areas of bleeding and frank ulcerations that are you know, quite, quite robust. And as we talk about the models themselves, we offer a number of different animal models for colitis. Um, they range in terms of uh, the approach, in terms of induction, whether it's a chemically induced model to a uh, more biologically induced model cell transfer. Um, the duration can vary drastically from a three to four day study and in a very acute chemical induced model to a you know, six to eight weeks in a uh, more chronic inflammation model like the adoptive transfer colitis model. And so we'll talk through these models as we go through some additional slides here and we'll show some, some experimental designs and, and talk about some of the data that comes out of them. But this, this chart just kind of shows a general overview of the main models that we work with on a routine basis. So the first model that we're going to talk about uh, is the DSS-induced colitis model. So this is a very common model, and I would say, um, if we look in the literature base, it's a, you know, probably one of the more, more commonly published disease models for IBD. Um, I think there's a, you know, a good reason for that. It's a relatively straightforward model to conduct. There's a lot of the data out there to make comparisons to. Um, the disease is robust and reproducible. And it provides a, a kind of a happy medium between a, an acute model and a more chronic model. Um, the approach that we most commonly run, as it can be seen here, is, is using DSS from day zero to five, and these animals will develop a persistent and chronic colitis that goes out through about three weeks. Um, when we track these animals, we'll do endoscopy at a few different time points to look at the progression of disease. In this particular study where I'm going to show data from, we're looking at two uh, commonly used biologics as positive control to show what their effect typically is in these models. One being the anti-P40 monoclonal antibody, and then another being the anti-TNF uh, monoclonal antibody. So when we start looking at the data from these models as we, as we run these studies. What we see is a very typical induction pattern. And as we look at the, the red line here, this is our, our, our vehicle control group. So after the exposure of DSS and removal of DSS, the animals will develop a very robust and reproducible weight loss that typically starts to occur around day six. 
and pretty much invariably peaks between day 9 and 10. The protocols that we have set up at BioModels allow us to track animals um, or to continue to have animals to go up to 30% weight loss. So you can induce relatively severe disease without having to worry about any um, you know, major IAP hook requirements to euthanize animals early, given that we know that the animals will recover their body weight once they reach that peak disease. And one of the important things to keep in mind as we look at these models is, is how some of these data points will, will start to separate. Um, if you look here at the, the weight curve specifically, you know, the animals peak weight loss at, at day 9 and 10, and then start to recover pretty, pretty dramatically, and they're almost back to baseline by the time we end the study on day 21. One of the key things to note there, though, is that even though these animals have recovered their body weight, they still have very active diseases, which can be seen over here from the endoscopy scores. So when we see you know, an endoscopy score, as we're looking here in the red line, again, focusing just on the vehicles, uh, an endoscopy score of two and a half, it means that pretty much all the animals have at least friability or bleeding, um, and, and pretty much uh, all have you know, good levels of inflammation and edema. Um, so that's pretty much what we try to target for this model. We don't want to have the disease so severe that you can't see um, a therapeutic effect, but you also don't want it so mild that it um, basically closes off your therapeutic window. Um, when we look at the effects of the positive controls or comparator compounds in this model, um, we do see a very, typically see a very robust effect of anti-P40. Um, and so this, this was starting treatment on day six. And basically what you can see is that treatment with the anti-P40 monoclonal antibody pretty much truncates, and it doesn't completely inhibit, but it truncates the weight loss that's observed in these animals pretty drastically. Um, we can also see that it has a pretty profound effect on endoscopy scores. Um, interestingly, the anti-TNF antibody has virtually no effect on body weight, and, and to an extent, a lesser effect on endoscopy scores, um, although that those effect is you know, sometimes uh, statistically significant. And if we look down here, what we can see, this, this figure here is basically just intended to show what the histopathology looks like, um, the correlate to some of the endoscopy images. And we've done a lot of regression analysis and, and things like that, looking at the correlation between endoscopy and histology over the years. Um, and there's a very strong correlation um, to, between the, the two data sets. So basically what we can say is if we're doing repeated measures of endoscopy in the in-life study, that if you were to sacrifice these animals at that time, um, the histology would basically correlate to what we're showing. Another variation on the DSS model that we run is a more chronic model. Um, this, this model uses repeated cycles of DSS. So instead of using just a day zero to five exposure, we'll do um, a five day on, seven day off paradigm where the animals will be treated with three cycles of, of, of DSS at a lower concentration. Um, this model is useful for looking at, you know, kind of longer-term dosing in terms of uh, looking at therapeutic interventions, so allowing disease to develop and then start treatment. Um, it's also been shown to have slightly more um, fibrosis and, and long-term consequences of, of inflammation. So if you were looking at a compound that um, may affect inflammation as well as um, fibrosis, um, these more chronic models are sometimes good for testing that. Uh, this particular study that we're going to show data from looked at a, a variety of kind of small molecule drugs as opposed to biologics, which we used in the first one. So the common, you know, prednisolone, and these are all kind of in that, remember that pyramid from the earlier uh, slide, these are kind of the second tier level of, of therapies, so the immunosuppressives. So prednisolone, cyclosporin A, and 6 thioguanine With the repeated cycles model of DSS, um, typically what we see is a very small change in body weight early on after that first cycle. It's not until we reach the second cycle, which is usually from day 12 to 15 or something, day 12 to 16, where the animals will actually start to lose weight. Um, and then with the third cycle, basically, you can see a little bit of another dip here. Um, the animals will basically be um, continued forward with that same level of weight loss and same disease activity. Um, one of the important things, I think, to note in this model um, is that even though the small molecules have, have, have a, a, you know, a profound biological effect, um, looking at treatment intervention with them is sometimes difficult, especially if you're looking at something like prednisolone, um, which can actually exacerbate weight loss. Um, and, and it makes looking at 
some of the classical data from IBD models a little tough to interpret, um, especially if you're relying on weight loss as one of your primary indicators of efficacy. Um, because while prednisolone we know works clinically and has you know, marginal or reasonable effects, I guess I could say, in the DSS model um, in terms of mucosal healing and, and inflammation, the weight curves look, look pretty bad. Um, and what we'll do on the next slide is go into these endoscopies for us a little bit, but what we basically are showing here is that these animals will develop a very persistent disease, you know, starting as early as day 10 um, and continuing, you know, to day 34 and even well beyond that. So this slide here focuses on the, on the endpoint uh, of that study where we basically euthanized the animals on day 34 following an endoscopy and looked at the, um, the effects of, of that on colonic inflammation as well as the endoscopy scores and correlating the two. Um, what we can see here as we go from left to right, the no GSS vehicle control obviously is normal tissue, um, you know, endoscopy score of zero, and a very low some histology score. Um, the histopath score basically takes into account inflammation, edema, and tissue necrosis. And those three scores are summed to get a some, some disease. And as you go into the vehicle group here, obviously we have more severe disease with bleeding. And if we look at the pathology, this pathology here, see large areas of inflammation, um, regions where the epithelium is completely denuded, and um, you know, very active disease. And we can see those correlates here on the, on the bar graphs below. And as we go further to the right, we look at the immunosuppressive therapies. These all responded pretty similarly to one another in this model and had about a 20% reduction in endoscopy scores, you know, from a score of about 2.8 down to a score of you know, 2.2 to 2.3. Interestingly, if we look at the histopathology scores here, the effect isn't quite as, the magnitude of effect isn't quite as big, but the direction that the effect is occurring and the differences between, the, uh, between all the treatments is, is virtually identical to what we're seeing um, endoscopically. Again, supporting that you know, the role of the endoscopy is, um, you know, is important and is a, is a nice tool to do those repeated measures of assessment. Um, moving on from the more chronic chemical models of DSS, the next two studies that we're going to talk about are, are TMBS models. And, and these data are TMBS and Exosolum. These are both pretty similar models in the respect that they're very acute, short-term duration, um, are done by an acute intrarectal administration of the, of the chemical agent, and disease is, is very acute in terms of its um, progression and also very quickly um, returns to essentially normal tissue. Um, so if we look here, these studies weren't using interventions. Um, the TNBS and Exolism model are, are, are notorious, I think, for having um, not the greatest positive control responses. So what we're showing here is more of a um, dose response to TNBS, looking at how we can basically modulate disease severity with increasing doses of TNBS. Um, and the same is true uh, with weight loss. So as we go up higher with higher doses of TNBS, you see more weight loss, which makes a lot of sense. Again, these studies are very short term. The inflammation that you see is a little different than what you would see in, in DSS. It's not quite as um, robust, um, but you do see a lot of superficial mucosal ulceration. Um, it just doesn't come with the same levels of inflammation that you would see in DSS. And exosolone, another model, as I mentioned, it's very similar to TNBS in the duration and as well as the, the levels of disease. The, again, looking at the progression here, you see it peaking by day three and starting to start slightly better by day five. Um, and with both TNBS and DSS, if we go out to day 12, essentially the tissue returns to almost a normal state. A model that's been used more specifically to look at the innate immune system is the CD40 agonist model. And we, for this model, we, again, use the two biological controls, anti-P40 and anti-TNF. Um, it basically, this model is induced by a single induction um, of the CD40 agonist. And it's, again, another short-term um, disease model, usually tracking it out seven days. Um, one of the things about this model, I think, that is, is slightly different and we'll see a little bit in terms of um, disease severity, is that it's not as severe in terms of the um, visual I guess, impact of the endoscopy score. So it, it, it usually peaks around a score of two. So it's a little bit more mild than DSS or any of the other chemical models. And the same is true with the weight loss. You know, we're seeing about a 10% weight loss of this model versus a you know, 15 to 20% weight loss in the, uh, in, in the other model. 
So in terms of looking at a, um, a response, it makes it a little tougher. But we can see here that, that both the anti-TNF and anti-P40 antibodies work really well um, in mitigating the disease. So it's a, you know, I think in terms of hierarchical use of these models, um, sometimes the models that, that have less severe disease are just a, it's a little harder to interpret the ultimate effects of a therapy. And then for the last kind of category of models that I'm going to talk about before switching over to Caitlin here are about the adoptive transfer models. The adoptive transfer models are, you know, going to be heavily focused on T cell involvement. And essentially, it's probably one of the more, I guess, physiologically relevant models that we, that we work with in IBD. It's a chronic model, which I think provides some major advantages in looking at terms of long-term dosing. It, it does respond really well to the biologics as well, you know, it has the DSS and um, the anti-C40 mo model. For this model, basically what we're doing is harvesting splenocytes in isolation and then, then isolating naive T cells from those splenocytes and from C57 mice and then basically transferring them into a Reg2 deficient mice, um, so basically a completely immunocompromised animal. And then as the cells engraft, essentially what happens is you start to look at T cell expansion and movement of those cells to the appropriate target tissues, and the animals will develop inflammation and disease. So typically the way that adoptive transfer models have been run historically is that it's been a, using a cell sorter for isolation of CD45 RB high um, T cells. There's a couple different ways of doing this, um, and then you can look here at the the left side is the kind of the classic approach. So most of the literature that you'll read on adoptive transfer focuses on this model. Basically what it does is it uses two rounds of sorting um, where the cells are going to be all positively labeled with antibodies. And those labeled cells will be isolated using a cell sorter. You can get a really nice population of T cells, um, very pure. However, there's a newer way that we've been doing it here focusing on a CD62L and a CD44 selection. And instead of using a positive selection, this is a negative selection, which allows us to isolate the naive T cells a little quicker. Cells aren't going to be tagged with any antibodies, so they tend to be a little happier and a little healthier. And it's also um, sterile versus using a cell sorter, which uh, obviously a lot of different things can, can be sent through at different times. So our focus in, in all the data that I'm going to show moving forward is, is using the CD62L approach um, rather than the CD44 or CD45 RB high. Um, we have used both internally. The models will run very similar to one another. The CD62 model seems to be a little quicker in terms of disease onset, but in general the models are virtually indistinguishable um, because the cell populations that you're isolating are essentially the same. So the model that we're going to, or the data that we're going to talk about here, again, is using some of the biologic therapies, uh, the anti-TNF, the anti-P40. And basically what we have here is a study with five groups, a naive group, um, a group that is a, a looking at naive T cells, and then another group that is using memory T cells. So essentially, if you have memory T cells in the mix here, the animal shouldn't develop disease. So this is kind of an internal model standard or model control. Uh, we don't typically run this in, in many of our studies, but um, it's a good way to look at the model validation aspect of it. And then the other two groups are going to be just the same um, naive T cells with and without the, or, or with, the, with the two different biologic therapies. Now, one of the things that we do with our model that's a little bit different than, um, I think, classically run is that we actually will do a um, blood collection on day 13 of the model and look at T cell engraftment. This helps us basically randomize the animals and eliminate any animals from study prior to treatment that don't engraft. And as we've shown repeatedly that if the animals don't have T cells by the time they reach day 13, they're basically not going to develop disease and um, you know, basically should not be included in the study. So this helps in terms of the data analysis, the consistency of the data that comes out of the experiment and um, helps us more appropriately power the studies to uh, achieve statistical results. Um, as I mentioned, this model is, is, is longer in duration. If we look at the, um, the red and the yellow lines here, the yellow line is just a naive animal that was, did not undergo any sort of um, manipulation. 
the red line is an animal that was injected with memory T cells as opposed to naive T cells. So uh, no disease development there, no body weight loss. Um, and then the, the groups below this are the animals that were um, induced with naive T cells and um, treated with uh, one of the biologic therapies. So if we look here, the, the real beginning of the weight loss, and the beginning of the changes usually occurs within three to four weeks of the transfer. These, this is a progressive model. So as you can see, the, as the animals continue to go out in time, the disease tends to get more severe. What you can also see is that both the TNF and the anti-P40 do exhibit relatively good protection of, of body weight loss. This model, I think, is, is unique in the fact that the animals are, don't respond necessarily as consistently as they do in some of the chemically induced models, meaning that there are going to be animals that develop more severe disease than others. And it does make for a little bit noisier data in terms of body weight. However, the, when you start looking at endpoints and histology data, I think it's just as clean as any of the chemical models can be. One of the other things to note about this model is that the disease severity is going to be a little less severe than what you see in a chemical model, meaning that you're not going to get as much mucosal ulceration, but you do get a, a lot of um, in, in very consistent inflammation. And the inflammation here not only affects the colon, but also has small bowel involvement. So it makes it a little bit more of a, I guess, a physiologically relevant model for something like Crohn's disease in terms of where it's, uh, in terms of where the disease is located. So with that being said, so we've basically gone through and reviewed the current state of IBD and a number of the models that we run here at Biomodels. I'm now going to hand this over to Caitlin, who's going to talk about the microbiome, discuss some of the approaches that we can use in these animal models to manipulate the microbiome and some UCDF data. All right, Caitlin, all yours. Hi, everyone. I'm just going to jump right in. Um, so I think we've all heard a lot about the gut microbiome. Um, it's certainly um, prevalently talked about in the um, news space. Um, and the microbiome is reported to play a role in a myriad of disease states including autoimmune diseases, mood disorders, allergic diseases, et cetera. But what is the gut microbiome? It's the phrase that we use to describe the trillions of bacteria that live in the gut of humans and other mammals, for that matter. And the gut microbiome represents thousands of species-level phylogenetic types. The gut microbiome comes in a couple of different flavors. First are mutualists or commensals. These are bacteria that are permanent residents of the gut microbiome but they don't play, um, or at least they're not known to play, either a beneficial or a detrimental role to the host. The second flavor are symbionts. Symbionts live in homeostasis with the intestinal immune system, and they're thought to be health-promoting. They can play roles in nutrition and metabolism, drug metabolism, defense against opportunistic pathogens, and in the prevention of inflammatory diseases. The final flavor are pathobionts. Pathobionts are also permanent um, residents of the gut microbiome. However, under certain conditions, they can cause disease in the host, although they typically do not. And when the gut microbiome is in homeostasis, these three flavors of the gut microbiome are all, they're all balanced with each other. Under certain situations, however, these microbiomes can become, or the residents of the microbiome can become imbalanced, and we refer to that as dysbiosis. Dysbiosis is associated with multiple disease states, including inflammatory diseases like IBD, autoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis, and allergic diseases like asthma. While there's certainly a genetic component to dysbiosis, as mutations in genes like the NOD2, receptor, the NOD2 gene or the alpha 3 receptor gene um, are associated with dysbiosis, it's likely that there's a lot of environmental factors in dysbiosis as well. And certain lifestyle choices like stress or medical practices such as radiation have also been shown to induce dysbiosis. So when it comes to IBD, the literature does support a role for the intestinal microbiome in multiple mouse models of inflammatory bowel disease. And the microbiome has been shown to either exacerbate or protect depending on the different species that we're studying. For example, Crepitaliaceae species have been shown to exacerbate chemically induced colitis models. And Helicobacter species have been demonstrated to drive colitis in the IL-10 knockout mouse. However, there's other species that have been shown to be protective in mouse models. Um, certain Clostridium species can confer resistance to colitis. And polysaccharide A that's produced by Bacteroides fragilis has been shown to confer protection from Helicobacter-induced colitis in IL-10 knockout mice. 
Um, there's a similar role for the microbiome in IBD from the clinic. There are certain species of the microbiome that have been demonstrated to be increased in patients with Crohn's disease as compared to patients that are healthy. And similarly, there are other species that have been shown to be decreased in patients with Crohn's disease as compared to healthy patients. And I just wanted to highlight that two of the species, or the fat groups rather, that are shown to be decreased in Crohn's disease patients are Bacteroidales and Clostridiodales, which I showed in the previous slide, have been shown to confer protection in mouse models of IBD. So when it comes to studying the microbiome in animal models, there's a couple of different approaches that we can take, and I'm just going to go through all or the approaches that we regularly use um, just briefly. So the first is what I refer to as vendor comparisons. It's been demonstrated in the literature that animals that are sourced from different vendors have different microbiomes. Um, they're raised in completely different places, so this makes sense. But we can take advantage of those different microbiomes, and we can induce the disease state in the animal source from the different vendors and see if the animals respond differently either to the disease induction, whether that's by disease prevalence or um, how strong the disease is, or in terms of how the disease responds to therapeutics. And the pros of this approach are that it's cost effective. However, it can be of a limited, mechanis of limited mechanistic value, as there are certainly other differences in animal source from different vendors besides the microbiome. The second approach is one where we manipulate the microbiome. So we can do that either by pre-treating the animals with antibiotics, or we can overload their um, endogenous microbiome by giving daily high doses of specific bacterial compositions, or by giving the animals fecal microbial transplants, or FMTs. And the FMTs can be sourced either from um, human patients that have different disease states or from different, uh, different mice. The pros here are that, once again, it's pretty cost effective, and it is somewhat mechanistic in that you can give the animals different compositions and then see how they respond either to the disease state or how they respond to different therapeutics. However, a con is that the animal does have a full microbiome upon dosing. So um, you have to balance how the microbiome that they have is going to affect the microbiome that you're dosing them with. The final approach is the use of germ-free and notobiotic mice. These animals arrive at our facility completely germ-free, so they have no endogenous microbiome whatsoever. And they're housed in our germ-free isolators, so we're able to maintain their germ-free status throughout the experiment. So this allows us to both compare the way the model runs in animals that lack a microbiome versus the animals that have one, but we can also dose the germ-free mice with different microbial compositions. And as they're housed under germ-free conditions, we know that the only microbiome that they have is the microbiome that we put in which lets us very cleanly determine how the model responds to that specific bacterial composition. So as I said, it's very mechanistic, and there's no need for pretreatment, as the mice are already germ-free, um, but it is quite resource intensive. So I'm now going to go through use of these different approaches in our um, chemically-induced IBD model. So the first is the vendor comparisons approach. So in this experiment, we used the 3% uh, DSS acute colitis model. And we compared um, the way the model ran in animals that were sourced from Charles River Laboratories versus animals from Taconic Biosciences. When we compared the animals from the different vendors, we saw that though the kinetics of body weight loss were similar, magnitude differed. The animals that were sourced from Charles River lost more body weight um, than did those animals sourced from Taconic. When it came to the colitis severity score as measured by endoscopy, both the magnitude and the kinetics differed. The Charles River animals um, had a higher colitis score at an earlier time point than, than did the animals sourced from Taconic. So next we used our microbiome manipulation approach. In this study, we pretreated mice um, with an antibiotic regimen that consisted of ampicillin, vancomycin, metronidazole, and clindamycin um, for five days prior to inducing uh, colitis with 3% DSS. And interestingly, what we found are that the animals that were pretreated with antibiotics actually showed mortality. Um, and this is pretty uncommon. We don't normally see mortality in our DSS colitis model. This indicated to us that the animals that had their microbiome pre-manipulated through this antibiotic regimen were more sensitive to induction of colitis with DSS. Um, and we also saw um, increased body weight loss in these animals. 
Finally, um, I wanted to just briefly go over uh, how the colitis model runs in germ-free mice. So in this study, we actually used a slightly lower DSS dose. We used 2.5% DSS. And we treated this model um, as a very acute model in that the animals were taken down pretty early on day 10. Similar to what was observed in the experiment where we dosed the animals with antibiotics, we saw quite a bit of mortality in the germ-free mice that were given DSS, um, as much as 75%. And again, that's very uncommon for our DSS model. There's usually no mortality observed. The animals also lost increasing body weight and had a colitis severity score of about a two. Um, so again, similar to what we saw with the antibiotic dosed mice, this data indicated to us that the animals that lacked a microbiome had increased sensitivity to colitis induced by DSS. So just to briefly, I guess, review what we just talked about, we talked about how animals sourced from different vendors, in this case, Charles River Labs, this is Taconic, respond differentially to DSS-induced colitis, both as measured by body weight loss and by endoscopy score. I also showed you that antibiotic-treated conventional Charles River animals demonstrated increased mortality in the DSS model and that germ-free animals from Taconic have also had increased sensitivity to DSS-induced colitis. There are certainly some unanswered questions in this data set, specifically when we're looking at the vendor comparisons data. Because we didn't, haven't done any sequencing yet, we don't know if the differences that we saw were truly driven by the microbiota or if it was due to genetic drift um, between the two animal vendors. And some future direction studies we'd like to move forward with are using these germ-free and notobiotic mice and comparing the way the disease model runs when using different um, defined microbial species. So I'm going to switch gears and move on to talking about our infectious colitis model, um, which is induced by infection of Clostridium difficile. Mm -hmm. um, so Clostridium difficile, or C. diff, as I'm going to refer to it for the remainder of the talk, is the major cause of antibiotic-associated diarrhea and colitis. It causes mild diarrhea, diarrhea to life-threatening fulminant colitis and can also present with systemic complications, such as hepatic abscess or renal failure. C. diff are gram-positive anaerobic spore-forming bacteria. These infectious spores can persist in the environment and are highly resistant to common disinfectants. Moreover, the spores can survive passage through the stomach, um, so they're not particularly sensitive to the acidic environment of the stomach. And when they hit the gut, that's when they germinate. Infection is associated with antibiotic drug therapy. And the hypothesis is that antibiotics that spare C. diff but suppress the intestinal microbiota will allow the C. diff to proliferate and produce exotoxins. And the toxins then cause intestinal damage and inflammation. Um, the current treatment strategy is to treat with antibiotics, either metronidazole or vancomycin. However, neither is fully effective. And as many as 20 to 35 percent of patients who appear cured by this therapy um, will go on to develop secondary disease. C. diff has been studied in a number of different animal models, including hamsters, guinea pigs, rabbits, rats, germ-free and conventional mice, as well as germ-free piglets. The hamster model is the, has been the most traditionally used. However, recently developed mouse models more closely resemble the disease symptoms in humans. So we chose to move forward with a model that was developed by Chet et al. in mice. So the way the study was designed, animals were pre-treated with an antibiotic mixture of canamycin, genomycin, colistin, metronidazole, ciprofloxacin, and vancomycin in their drinking water for 10 days. Um, they had a couple days without the antibiotics, and then mice received an IP injection of clindamycin. And the purpose of this is to clear out the animal's endogenous microbiome so the C. diff has room to take hold and engraft. Animals were then infected with increasing concentrations of C. diff bacteria. And this is a little bit different than some of the literature in that we use actual vegetative bacteria in our model rather than using spores. So we found that um, we saw dose-dependent mortality in this model depending on the amount of C. diff bacteria that was given. Animals that were dosed with 100 CFU had a mortality rate of about 40%, and the animals that were sourced with higher CFU um, had higher mortality. We similarly saw dose-dependent body weight loss, um, with the most body weight loss observed in animals that were dosed with the highest amount of C. diff. And interestingly, the 
animals that were dosed with that high amount of C. diff actually took longer for their body weight to um, resolve and come back up to normal, and it really never did actually fully resolve. As I mentioned that the C. diff toxins are a um, major driver of pathology in humans, we also wanted to look at the amount of C. diff toxin present in the cecums of the animals upon takedown. And we found that when measured by ELISA, this is just measuring presence or absence. We saw significantly increased amounts of C. diff toxin in the animals that were dosed with the two lower amounts of C. diff. However, the animals that were dosed with the higher dose of C. diff did not have a significantly higher amount of C. diff toxin present in their cecums. We also used a cytotoxicity assay to measure the toxin activity. So this is looking not just at presence or absence, but at whether the toxin can kill cells. And once again, we saw a significantly increased amount of the cytotoxin um, activity titer in animals dosed with the lower C. diff concentrations as compared to animals dosed with either antibiotic only or naively. So in conclusion for the C. diff portion, we discussed that C. diff is a gram-positive anaerobic spore-forming bacteria that causes antibiotic-associated colitis with no fully effective treatment. And I showed you that in our mouse model of C. diff-induced infectious colitis, we saw dose-dependent mortality and body weight loss, as well as increased toxin presence and activity in, ce in cecum contents from these animals. Um, so with that, I just wanted to briefly go over um, what we talked about in the webinar today. We discussed the current state of IBD, as well as several animal models of IBD and colitis, um, the role of the microbiome and experimental approaches to study this role in IBD and colitis, and finally, an introduction to infectious colitis and the C. diff mouse model. Um, so just like to take the time to acknowledge um, our team of biomodels who make all this work possible, um, especially our chief scientific officer, Steve Sonis. Um, with that, we'll be happy to address any questions by email. We'd like to thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Caitlin and Greg. Thank you all so much for coming, and thank you to Biomodels for sponsoring today. Have a great day.